Uh, now, you may think you just came up here to relax and lie back, but I'm going to ask you some questions to keep you awake. So the first thing is, uh, can anyone tell me what that structure is that I'm showing on there? Do I hear DNA? But you can sort of see there's a cancer is incorporated into DNA, and I've done that picture to show that DNA and cancer, cancer is a disease of DNA, and DNA is critical to everything we do about it, trying to treat it now, understand it. I'm going to give a bit of background. You've already seen a nice slide uh, on the general sorts of cancer and leukemias. Um, now, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. There's 330,000 cancers a year in this country. How many deaths a year do you think there are? A third? Well, a third. That's very, very optimistic. Half. So there's 162,000 deaths. And the cancer, you'll see the Cancer Research UK campaign. This is the first year that only half, the less than half the people die. Previously, more than half the people died. So it's a break point, really, that it's for the first time half the people are, are living. So half live before it was only a third that might have lived. So it's a dramatic change. Uh, one in three people will get cancer, and half of those will be cured. Uh, and one in four deaths in the UK are due to cancer, so it's a major cause of death. And 40% are preventable. Can anyone tell me what are the preventable causes of cancer? Smoking, Smoking that's right. Oh, that's fantastic. And uh, any other preventable causes of cancer? Sun exposure. Sun yes. Sorry? Yeah, sunlight, sun, uh, sun tans, yeah. Anything else? Toxic. Toxic chemicals, very rare, apart from cigarette smoke. Uh, anything else? Alcohol, obesity. Okay, so we, can, we know the cause is indirectly of 40% of all cancers, and if we followed what we were told to do uh, and had less red meat and uh, more fresh fruit and vegetables, 40% we of people wouldn't get cancer. So you might say, what's the point of finding out about the other 60%? If we already know what helps 40%, no one takes any notice. But it's now the first year that the smoking in this country is less than it was 100 years ago. So we can campaign and be effective in that area. Now, this is a busy slide, but it shows you the 10 most common cancers in men and 10 most common cancers in women. These are the, and you can see in men it's prostate, in women it's breast. Uh, what you can see very sadly is uh, lung cancer is creeping up in women and completely preventable. But if you then look at the causes of death, what you can see is uh, lung cancer, the number's at about 20 odd thousand, and the number of lung cancer uh, deaths is 19,000, so 20 odd thousand get it, 19,000 die, not very good. On the other hand, if you look at breast cancer, 48,000 get it, and 11,000 die, so it's doing much better. 75% of people are cured and aren't going to die of breast cancer. So there's some cancers that we can do really well on and have got dramatic changes over the last few years, but there's others where we are really not curing hardly anybody. If you look at, uh, again, we did, that was uh, one example, brain tumors, 4,700 uh, 4, uh, have it, uh, and uh, the, uh, the death rate for brain tumors is around 2 1,200, so pretty high death rate. Similarly here, if we uh, look at esophageal cancer, 5,000 there, uh, and esophageal cancer, 5,000 there, almost 95% death. So the CIUK and BRC, Biomedical Research Centre, are interested in focusing a lot more effort on these hard-to-cure cancers. But the principles are not very different from what has been the success in leukemia, which has always led the way uh, in terms of genetics. Now, it's a good news story, really, that the cancer mortality rate over time from the 1990s onwards has dropped. That's all cancer deaths in men and women. Women, of course, with their uh, better lifestyles and sensible behavior. You can see their death rate is always lower and is dropping, but so is men's. And it's really gratifying to see that. But there's not one single cause. I think the key thing here about treating, curing cancer is it goes all the way through from prevention, uh, like uh, with papillomavirus, the vaccination has not come through yet, uh, but obviously stopping smoking, screening for breast cancer, cervical cancer, understanding genetics. In the last 20 years, we've understood the genetics of breast cancer and colon cancer, 5% of those cancers, and we've been able to stop those cancers killing patients. Very important multidisciplinary teams. Uh, when I was a student, the surgeon was, was king, uh, and now no, no, no longer the case. Still very important. Uh, but uh, in the team I meet every week, and it's true across all the cancers, there's a multidisciplinary team that meets. We have about 50 in the breast team, and it includes surgeons, radiotherapists, medical oncologists, breast care nurses, imaging people, uh, pathologists, and we actually see all the details of that patient on that day. They've been examined and de in detail by one of the specialists there, and we can make a combined decision of all the different ways of treating cancer to get the right treatment for that patient. 
and that's contributed a lot. And the other thing is, we didn't used to be able to see where the cancer was, uh, but now with new scanners and so on, we can see exactly where it is, and that helps give radiotherapy better and decide on the treatments. This molecular pathology is a new way of looking at the cancer on the microscope. Again, you saw some of that from the leukemia, the detailed staining and characterization. And we can look at these and say, well, this cancer's got this pathway, that cancer's got that pathway. You choose a treatment. Surgery remains very important. It's changed radically in the last 20 years. And without doubt, surgery is the most important thing for curing cancer. Cut it out. And so if you cut cancer early, you can cure it with surgery alone. And one of the problems is, how does a surgeon actually see where he's cutting? You cut his brown, blobby, bleeding stuff. And how do you know where the edges are? Very difficult, very challenging. New drugs have made a major difference pretty well for all cancer types. And radiotherapy has changed dramatically. It used to be like a blast to give you nasty red scars, could cause necrosis and death of tissues. Now we can actually paint it almost like it's called painting. It's almost like a paintbrushing and just paint around the tumor and just give little bits and dabs with it with a, with, with a beam. So all that together is doing this. But England is still lagging behind the rest of Europe because it's not investing enough into that. So how does cancer develop? Now, this is going to sound to the very nitty-gritty, where all our discoveries are kind of come from. Uh, and uh, Alti Tung knew this. To defeat your enemy, you must know your enemy. And this is exactly where we are now in cancer. Can anyone spot what this is? DNA. It's a double helix, and it's got these little base pairs, which you've heard as, as the word or the code or the uh, spelling mistakes. So there's the DNA strand. And one cell has 3 billion base pairs per cell. He said 6 million bases. So one cell's got 6 billion of these in, OK? So how does it get that into a single cell when you think you've got 13 billion cells in your body? How does that get compressed in? So it's wrapped around every 180 base pairs, wrapped around a little protein core. So it's like little beads. And the beads cluster together and cluster together to stack up into what's called chromatin fibers and eventually into a chromosome. And we have 23 pairs of those, one from a mother and one from a father. So all that has to pack into the cell. Every single cell of the body's got to have that. And when the cell divides, it's got to unravel all those three billion and make another copy without making a single mistake. Because if you make a mistake, you're coding wrongly. So isn't it incredible? We all, don't all die of cancer at the age of 20, but we live to 75 with our cells dividing and doing that accurately. So there's a massive proofreading, accurate process going on. But it's also where this goes wrong that causes the cancer. So I was going to see if anyone knows the answer to this one. So in each one of our cells, we've got three billion base pairs. So if we unravel the DNA from every cell in our body and stretch it end-to-end, -end, how far would it go? There we are. Uh, this guy is really wise. You're the first person to ever answer that question correctly. He's a professor, really, and he's just uh, pretending to be a lay person. <laughs> <laughs> he's my driver. He has we told it before. <laughs> Anyway, you're quite right. So that gives you an incredible how compact the human body is, how difficult this is to reproduce. Now, as you might imagine, mistakes can occur. So this is the double-stranded DNA again. And you may notice at this time of the evening, your eyes are getting a bit blurry. Do you notice that it's getting a bit blurry? Uh, so you can get a break in the DNA, which is a single-strand break, or you can get a mismatch. You can see we've got green and yellow and blue and red pairing. But here, we've got a green and red, a mismatch. Or there could be a damage in the base. Or you get a double-strand break, or two blues could link together, which is an interstrand link. So there's lots of sorts of damage that occur from uh, smoking damage, from ultraviolet light, uh, from just the, when you do, try and make, replicate three billion base pairs, you make errors. So people who've got genetic diseases where they can't repair DNA properly get cancer. Uh, so that's the cause of cancer, and all the chemicals that cause cancer do that. They damage the DNA. But of course, if you have a repair defect in the DNA, and that's why you got the cancer, you might be able to treat the cancer by damaging the DNA further and killing it, because it's, it's got poor repair. You damage it further, and you will actually be able to kill it. And that's one sort of breast cancer, where there's a defect in DNA repair, the common form of hereditary breast cancer, has a defect in repair. That's probably why they get the cancer. But they're very sensitive to drugs that damage the DNA, so they can actually get fantastic results. Uh, but some tumors, of course, can repair the damage, so they can select the cells to repair it. And if they can then repair the damage that caused them, then they actually can be very resistant to the treatment. So it's kind of raising the issue that everybody's cancer is a bit different. And you can't tell by just looking at somebody, looking at that tumor, is this a good or bad repair pathway? So this is where the molecular pathology comes in. We've got to understand the biology. We've got to understand the genes to get the right treatments for patients. So here's a particular example. I showed you those little building blocks, the histones, that were the little proteins where the DNA wraps around to organize. 
It has to be wrapped up very nicely in those protein blobs, every 180 base pairs. So, and you imagine how many there are in one cell. So this is a Lego brick. It's an six, it's a eight pin brick. Do you know how many different ways there are to arrange six of those? You can't answer because you already answered one question, right? <laughs> How many different ways are there to arrange six Lego bricks? Bearing in mind how many thousands or millions of uh, proteins we've got all clogging together in a certain order. Well, I'm going to give you, how, can you... Can I have a guess from the audience? How many ways? Hundred? Thousand? Million? Is a million too many? Well, it's a billion. It's nearly a billion. It's actually 915 million. And you can have the formula to do that if you like. But it's actually... So that tells you, just with something as simple as that, how complex it can be. So, so again, you can see how important it is for those proteins to be organized and have signals and to latch together the right way. And a lot of mutations, about 100 mutations in common cancers now, are in how those protein bricks build together. So they give you an abnormal structure. So the genes switch on, that shouldn't switch on or switch off. So we're controlling the switches. So these are like switches all the way along the DNA. Not only is it damaged to DNA, but the switches that regulate it can be damaged. So you switch things on and off wrongly. And there's a big research effort here in Oxford to find chemicals that will correct them and correct those bricks, make, fix them. And actually, it's very exciting that um, what's called the Structural Genome Consortium has got eight companies, eight drug companies that would normally be rivals, to come together to be able to find molecules that can correct this and that anyone in the world can use them for further research. So I think that's a great example of how industry and academia can come together to try and develop cures for cancer. Now, I've already told you that... Uh, the DNA is what's gone wrong. That's how the DNA damage occurs and causes cancer. And the genes that get damaged, because there's about 300 things that are particularly liable to cause cancer, and they're called oncogenes. So they're, they're normal genes in the cells, and then a cancer-causing uh, like ultraviolet light or chemicals damages the gene, and it changes the DNA, as I've just shown you. And it can change the switch, or it can change the gene to work in a different way. And that oncogene is then causing the cell to become cancerous. And we now know... Uh, about three to 400 different oncogenes that cause cancer. But there's a basic principle behind it is that they regulate how the cells grow or how the DNA switches on the cells and switch on the proteins that make the cells grow. And so this is an example. Every cell's got a little outside membrane, and there's the outside matrix which sticks the cells together, and inside the cell where the nucleus is where the DNA has gone wrong. So the DNA can code for growth factors that bind to cell surface proteins called receptors and make it grow. So there's a, probably about 200 different sorts of receptors, because if you imagine muscle cells, brain cells, skin cells, they all need different ways of growing. They all have different receptors. So that's why cancers, there's 200 different sorts of cancer just in different organs and tissues. Because every tissue is going to be a bit different. That's why it's going to be complex. There's no one way that's going to treat all cancers. And this is why we've got to define them better. And that's one of the big advances this molecular can provide us with. So there we see the growth factor binds there. And if you're making too much of it, because that gene is switched on now, churns it out then we can get a lot of signaling. And so there's several now drugs for pretty well many of the common cancers that will block the binding or the activation or the downstream signaling pathways. And I, I've got to go through them all. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of how it's revolutionized our treatment in relatively common cancers. And there's a massive effort going on to either use antibodies, as you heard about before, blocking CD47, but blocking the growth factor or the receptor, or small molecules that will get into the cell and block it that way. So this is an example of a recent study, and we're now using this treatment in Oxford. This is a patient who's got breast cancer. It's spread around the body, so they are going to die of it, uh, uh, but uh, they have been treated with uh, two new antibodies that target a growth factor receptor, and it's a very high in breast cancer called HER2. So what you can see is this goes down to four years. So these are patients who've got cancer spread around the body, but they're still living four or five years these days compared to what it used to be like. And what you can see here is... Uh, chemotherapy, standard chemotherapy, without the antibodies. And you can see that uh, if you look at 50% survival, it's about 30 months. But if you have the two antibodies together that block the signaling pathway, it's another 15 months survival. Now, that was an advanced cancer, and we're now taking it forward to first-line treatment in breast cancer. When patients come through the door, we do the special test, this molecular pathology. If they've got this receptor high on their cancer, they'll get this up front of the two antibodies to try and treat early breast cancer and because we've learned from the advanced breast cancer, and we're going to go back to the early stages now. And so that's how we can take things forward to the clinic earlier, by knowing what works for visible cancers. And this is another example. This is a patient who had malignant melanoma. This cancer has spread from the skin cancer all around their body. You can see how extensive it is. This is a scan that shows it's a, uh, all the skin and in some of the organs in the backbone. 
And two weeks after starting a drug that blocks this oncogene, which is a signaling pathway that's switched on, uh, RAF it's called, you see what's happened. It's a dramatic response. So that's because we, that we knew what was wrong. We knew the genetics. The signal has gone wrong, made the drug, blocked it, and that's what happened. So the thing is, of course, it hasn't completely gone, and these ones were resistant and started to grow back. So this is a big challenge, and that's why we need to biopsy patients a lot more and then reanalyze them again and see what's happened again. So there's a becoming a uh, routine practice. So all my breast cancer patients have several things looked for. All melanoma patients have this mutation looked for. And so routinely, in the Oxford now, many tumors, and the rheumatologist was doing it a long time ago, to pick the right drug for that patient. And that's one of the things with the BRC and the NHS, this 100,000 genomes, is Oxford as a major contributor to it, to try and learn the new pathways. I'm just telling you what we know now, but we don't know everything by any means. Now, those are going for the DNA. But actually, the cancer is going to grow, and it's going to spread around the body. So it's got to have a mechanism for doing that. How does that work? So although the DNA is what's gone wrong in the first place, it has to use mechanisms to escape around the body. And then the body fights back. So one of the first things that happens when the cancer cells grow, there's a green, they make a substance that stimulates a new blood supply. And you can see the new blood vessels growing into it. And that lets it get more oxygen to grow, gets rid of waste made by the growing cells, and it can then spread through these blood vessels around the rest of the body. So that's called angiogenesis, new blood supply. And this is why you all know that blood from any orifice, apart from when you got punched in the nose, is a bad sign. Blood in the urine, coughing up blood, blood in the stools. You should be seeing a doctor if there's, uh, if there's not some obvious cause for that. And that's because these new blood vessels are very fragile. They bleed. So bleeding is an early sign of cancer. So there's a scientific explanation for these signs. And this is an example, this is the work that I do. Uh, th there we can see here, a lump of cancer cells has started to grow, say, in the breast. And as it grows, it doesn't have a good sub blood supply, and it switches on a protein, a little green blob, that goes to a blood vessel nearby to stimulate the blood vessel to grow. And you see the blood vessel is attracted by these little green blobs that stick to the blood vessel cells. And of course, then it gives a good blood supply, plenty of oxygen, the tumor can grow and spread. So that's occurring in cancer early on. Without that, it can't grow. So it's another target. It's nothing to do with the DNA. Uh, it's to do with blocking the blood supply, because that's another rational target. And with several drugs now, there's 11 tumor types for which such drugs are now available. Uh, but again, it has to be the right patient and the right tumor. If we look at what that little green factor does, it's actually called vascular endothelial growth factor, because it makes the vascular endothelial cells, the cells lining the blood vessels, grow. And it sticks to this receptor on the cell surface and uh, will block the, uh, uh, stimulates uh, the cells to grow. Now, this is just to show you in real life. This, that was a cartoon. If we look at breast cancer, which is my speciality, we try and pick up breast cancer by screening. You look on the mammogram, and what you see is specks of calcium, because where there are abnormal cells, calcium from the blood tends to stick to them in breast. So this is actually a breast cancer in a pre-invasive phase, the sort of thing we hope to pick up on screening. Normally, the breast ducts, which carry milk to the nipple, that's their usual role, are just one row of cells around the edge. This duct is now full of cells. They're all cancer cells. But you'll notice they're not invaded out anywhere. They're just nicely contained there. They will never kill that patient. But you can see there's a blood vessel passing by that's been hijacked and attracted to wrap around that vessel, that tumor. And this is a normal blood vessel. But you can see already early on, it's making something that's being attracted in. So just looking at the pathology, you can see something's going on there. And those are the ones that are going to do worse because, of course, uh, if you're getting a blood supply, you know a little step to get into that and spread. So we want to pick them up just before then. And this is an example from a patient who had a cancer from the kidney that spread to the skin. And this shows the blood, it's a massive angiogenesis inside. You can see that substances made by the cancer are actually leaking out into the skin, causing massive new blood vessels. So this is just to show you the, how the reality of what angiogenesis is like and what we are trying to block. So this shows the green factor again that the tumor is making that stimulates that. And what we want to do is have drugs that will block it. So you heard about the antibodies. And you see here it's binding to the VEGF as opposed to the CD47. And we've killed a cancer cell by stopping its blood supply. And I think uh, you hopefully you've woken up a bit. Uh, so that's the cartoon. But let's go back to reality. And this is, again, one of the breakthroughs in cancer has been imaging and being able to see what's really going on, not just a black and white blob. What is the blood supply like to the cancer in real time? So this is a study we've done in breast cancer where we want to use that antibody 
to treat patients to stop the blood supply to the tumour. So this is a, a scan of the breast tumour in patients before any treatment. And we've done a scan to look at the blood supply before and two weeks after that antibody. And what you can see here, there's the blood supply. Pretty nice. But it's actually got worse. It's got more blood supply after getting the antibody. Here you see a patient who's got a very big blood supply to the tumour. It's all around the edge because so it's growing into it. Two weeks later, the blood supply is markedly reduced, but there's still a lot of tumour there. In this patient, you can see a lot of blood supply. Two weeks later, the centre's gone dark, and that's dead. So we have one patient, we're giving that same antibody, it's killed 90% of the tumour. Another patient has actually grown through the treatment, it's got on getting worse, and there's a response for the blood vessels, but the tumour hasn't died. And as a result of that sort of observation, we now have programmes in our lab where we've discovered a new pathway by which the blood vessels grow, and we've got a big grant from Cancer Research UK to try and block that with antibodies. And again, we find that the way these tumour cells adapt is they adapt to grow when they've got low oxygen. And again, we have grants to look at this area. In fact, the drug perhexylene that you mentioned actually may be detrimental to cancer cell growth. So it's quite interesting how these things cross over. So uh, there is a way that we're trying to treat cancer, which is attacking how it spreads and how it grows, but not attacking the DNA. So it could be of general relevance. And you can actually see some nice pictures of this. This is a picture of a patient with kidney cancer it is spread to the rib. You see this big tumour here? It's got a central area. It's not got a good blood supply, but a nice white blood supply going into it. And a month or two later, it's gone completely. But many patients don't respond at all. So this is a problem. We can give a drug, and before we give that drug, we do not know if that patient's going to benefit or not. We have to give it to them and see if it works. It's what we call it the wonder drug. We wonder if it's going to work. <laughs> but... Uh, 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 a, but that's the challenge. So what we want to understand is from the genes, from the molecular biology, from the image, can we predict? Or can we just do a scan again? Just two weeks later, we can tell. We don't have to give someone a drug for three months. Can we just see dynamically within a short time what's happening? So those are the new ideas that we've got to realize that everyone's not going to respond to everything. Even when you have a drug that looks good, it's still going to vary. So variability, and it's a great problem. And this is a study we're just completing to try and understand what happens at the end. So this is a patient with kidney cancer. And he's got, see these are red and green marks. That's cancer in the bones. It's kidney cancer spread to the bones. And you can see this, see this green and red area here? Within about uh, four weeks, it's gone colorless. Still a bit left. But you can see that, that that's now gone. See that thing there? Gone. And that's a special scan that picks up blood vessels only. And you see it's gone. But then six months later, you can see the scan is remarkably red and there's been a rebound. So although we were able to stop the blood supply for about five or six months, somehow out of the, the cancer was able to bypass that, switch on another mechanism, and grow back. But because we're doing research here, we can biopsy those, we can look at the genes and try and understand what's gone wrong and to understand that. So this is, again, how the Biomedical Research Center is helping us. So uh, um, the, the, another section I'd like to talk about uh, is immunotherapy, which you've already heard about. It is sweeping the board. Uh, Oxford is one of the leading centers in Europe for this, uh, has a CRUK-funded center. We've actually built a lab that can do the very special tests you need to do, a bit like Hugh mentioned, that can do special tests in a refined way for patients to the right standards so we can monitor what's happening, why some patients might respond and some might not. And this is a very simple picture. There's a cancer cell, and someone mentioned T cells. Well, you might like to explain the T cells now you know what they are. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so these are one of your immune cells, T cells. And normally, they keep any cancer you get at bay. That's probably one of the reasons we don't get cancer. The uh, T cells recognize what the antigen on the tumor cell and will kill it. But the tumor cell switches on a defense mechanism called pdl uh, PDL1, and it sticks to a receptor on the T cell to switch it off. Now, this is a natural mechanism, but you can't have your T cells immune all the time because you get autoimmune disease. So you have to switch it off. And so the cancer cell is using what you normally use to switch off the response and switch it on to a high level. So a T cell comes along, tries to kill it. Cancer cell says, no, no, we'll switch you off. But if you have an antibody against either the, this arm or this arm, you can stop it. And so these, we have antibodies in the clinic and license for this or this, and the dramatic results. A melanoma, but also surprisingly lung cancer for the first time. And immunotherapy works against the cancer caused by smoking. It's just licensed. It works in bladder cancer. And so these are things we never thought would happen, but just in the last couple of years, because we understood this mechanism, we understood the biology, we could attack it. We couldn't possibly have made these antibodies a year or so ago because we didn't know how it worked. So I think these are examples of how science is so critical. This is a picture from the immunotherapy for melanoma. 
Uh, this is helping you. I don't have to ask your audience because you see the white arrows and you see these lumps of tumour on a scan and a few weeks later, see these big lumps here? They've gone. you just got normal ribs. And this is a measurement of uh, about 20 patients, lumps in melanoma. And they see within uh, 10 weeks, the tumours have shrunk down almost completely and disappeared. And they stay down like that for up to uh, uh, two years so far. But then a few patients, these one, two, three, they carried on growing. And these, they shrunk a bit, the new ones came on. So we saw a great result for many patients. But again, there's a group there that didn't respond. We got to then biopsy those again to understand. So this is why it's so important. That I'm so grateful that patients will join in our trials because uh, it may not benefit these poor patients at all, but it will better generate the next generation. And this is, of course, why we've got these antibodies now because the previous generation of patients helped us. Uh, so uh, I'm going to carry on with one final bit uh, because I, I tried to highlight to you uh, that we're a team and it's surgery, radiotherapy, medical oncology. And I've given you the systemic treatments that medical oncology is using, uh, like drugs, new drugs, targeted drugs, antibodies, blocking the immune system, blocking the blood supply. But there's a, there's a very simple treatment in principle that you cut the tumour out or you blast it with radiotherapy. But of course, radiotherapy isn't that simple at all. And this is a picture uh, uh, using ordinary x-rays. You've heard of x-ray therapy. And this is actually a sort of patient the parish looks after. Uh, it's got lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease. And this is a picture, CT scan. There's the lungs in black. There's the head. And the patient's arms are raised. You can see the, uh, the upper arm bones, the humerus raised there. And they've got some lymph glands in the neck here and into the chest and in the armpit. And we want to radiate those to cure the patient. And with a normal, uh, if you, so that's the looking face on. If you look from above, you can see uh, there we have the backbone, uh, the heart, the sternum. And here we can see again, this is, uh, so this is a patient with the backbone the heart, and the sternum. Now, if you use ordinary x-rays to treat, the ordinary x-ray therapy to treat that, when you look from above, you'll see it goes right the way through, because it goes right through the body, it goes right through the lymph glands area here, and through into the shoulder. And the one here in the neck glands goes right through, hits the heart, and goes into the spinal cord, which is not, which it happens, and we have to take that into account, but it's not great. You'd rather not do that, but it's going to cure the patient, and we'll get away, generally speaking, but we do know there's more heart disease in people who've had absolute radiotherapy. But there's a new sort of radiotherapy, which Oxford is going to be the only centre in Europe that has a research facility for this, for proton beams. There's going to be a routine centre in, in London and one in Manchester, but there will be no research facility there. So this is going to be set up in Oxford. And if you look at the beams here, you see this beam goes straight through, hits the heart, hits the spine, hits the shoulder. This beam goes through and it stops, stops dead there, and it just gets the lymph glands because it's controlled in a completely different way. And here you can shine it through and it just goes through the lymph gland areas and spares. So we spared all this area that was going to get unnecessary radiotherapy. So we think this is going to be a major advance. So it's not drugs, but it's actually, if you give patients drugs, you want to get the best result from the drugs, the best result from treatment, and all sorts of other things together. So you can see why it's so important. Finally, uh, again, BRC funded. Uh, I've just highlighted before, surgery is great to get rid of early diagnosed cancer. You want to cut around the edges, uh, but you can't actually see the edges. So this is a, a new dye and a new imaging system developed in Oxford. Uh, we always have students to help us. Uh, and, uh, and our surgeon is here looking through this new scope. And what it is, it goes through keyhole surgery. So you can look into the abdomen and you can see the tumour. But you can't, it looks a bit similar to normal tissue and you just see sometimes a little bit of extra blood supply, hard to spot. You give this dye and it lights the tumour up, but you can't see it through normal light. It's fluorescent. So you, normally you'd have to switch between a fluorescent light and a fluorescent imaging. So you have to get switching between fluorescence and white light. So you have two images and you're trying to look at them and cut it out while you look at two images at the same time. And you don't need me to tell you that's not going to be great. And so what they've been able to do is develop a new scope which superimposes the fluorescence and the white light at the same time, which is technically very demanding. So you can see exactly where to cut. And it's being done in trial now, in ovarian cancer, where you often have cancer seed around the abdomen. You want to cut it all out. So this is, again, so surgery advances massively. Uh, the last 20 years, and many of you may have had surgery, which is through a keyhole. Uh, and so uh, that, again, is part of the key treatment, working together as a team. So what's happened in Oxford is we had a great integration of cancer services. When I first started here, uh, here in 1975, these were like, some of the places where they, the Nissen huts, I wish they'd kept one. Some of you may remember the Nissen huts, I don't know. Uh, but now we've had a £125 million cancer centre where my unit is, state of the art machinery, and it's a great place to work and a great facility for our patients. I just want to show the teamwork, because um, I mentioned radiation, surgery, and medical oncology, my speciality. There's a new cancer centre, there's uh, the radiation oncology research centre, the WIN, where I and Parish work, the Botner centre for bone cancers, uh, the Wellcome centre, which is all of genetics, 
uh, Richard Olbeening for the epidemiology cancer, and lists a lot of the names of collaborations that are going on. They say cancer doctors are in a really powerful state because of all the extra funding, the link between university, the NHS, the money the BRC gives, and also a massive amount from charity. Cancer Research UK has made Oxford one of the two cancer centres, the big centres in the UK, and has given us an extra £5 million a year for research. And uh, we're very grateful that our patients uh, and our clinical fellows, colleagues, collaborate so well together. So this is my vision for the future treatment of cancer. We obviously have state-of-the-art imaging, which you might have to repeat early on, simple blood test or a simple t needle test to look at the genes from the cancer, from maybe a few cancer cells only. We know what the genes are and the abnormalities. We feed that into our data, and we then notice in our special machine will tell us what are the right drugs because we know what the mutations are, what's wrong with the DNA. We give the drugs to the patients. <laughs> Cured. But you'll notice, unfortunately, this patient sent to a fox. There's always side effects, and that's just one of the things that happens. <laughs> no gain without pain. So just as I say, that's it. That's what cancer is going to be in the future.